without further ado, I give you Greg Watson. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, with raising expectations like that can be pretty dangerous. I appreciate it very much, though. And it really is great to be here. Um, I, my respect for Mill City Grows, the work that Francie, Lydia, and the rest of you do is just unbelievable. So it, is a, it, it really is an honor. Uh, I'm going to try to, I'm going to rush through, and I do sometimes tend to talk fast, uh, not rush through, but I'm going to go through uh, the, sort of a formal presentation, but I would like to leave time uh, for, for questions. We've already had a bunch of conversations going here, so I think that might be the most valuable. Um, I did want to start, it is Happy Earth Day, and I thought maybe just kind of give a little background on where at least I come from and, and some of the tools that we've used over the years. This is actually, and by the way, I actually took this picture. This is, so I actually still do have my copy of the last Whole Earth Catalog, which is actually the first Whole Earth Catalog. Uh, but this was a, a, a magazine, or I should say a book that was published back in 1967, in the pre-internet days. And it was done right after, right before actually, Earth Day, but it was when people were beginning to understand that there's something wrong with the way that we were meeting our basic needs. Industrial agriculture, fossil fuel based energy, and so, you know, subsequently that led up to Earth Day, but a lot of that was protest, and a lot of it was saying what's wrong with the way that things are being done, and people like Stuart Brand, and then eventually folks like uh, John and Nancy Tavra, I'll talk about in just a little bit, said, can we start talking about alternatives? And in order to talk about the alternatives, people need to know what their options are. And again, this being the pre-internet days, they developed the, the Whole Earth Catalog, which really was a, an inventory of tools, access to tools, some hard tools, some soft tools, that just gave people a sense of what kinds of options were available to them to take some measure of control over meeting their basic needs. Because there's nothing more empowering. If you talk about what is it we can do in, you know, again, food, energy, shelter, if there are ways that individuals, families, communities can come together and say we can sort of extricate ourselves from the, from the system, not totally, but, but in ways that allow us to meet our basic needs, that in fact is, is very powerful. And this isn't anything new. Unfortunately, what happens is it's emergencies or crises that sort of pull us together and sort of help us understand what our real potential is. So this is like nothing new. We talk about local. We talk about urban agriculture. It happened during wartime. Right? Because people, you know, again, resources were scarce. Pe that's, that's, a, that's, that's uh, you know, right in the heart of Boston, that's Trinity Church in, in Boston, and the fields were plowed to, to provide food, right? Because not only did we not have, the, were the resources scarce, and that included petroleum, so we couldn't do what we have become used to here in Massachusetts, that is import food from across the country, across the world, uh, depending upon cheap energy. So we had to, we had to do those things. And, and the, the Fenway Park Victory Garden started out as a, as a Victory Garden, and now it's a big community garden in Boston. So we are kind of are, in fact, a little bit of returning to the future. When I first came to Boston, one of the first groups I, I hooked up with was a group called the Boston Urban Gardeners, which is great, an acronym being BUG. It couldn't be a more appropriate acronym than, than, than that. But it, was a, it really was a pre-internet social network. Bug was a very small organization, and by the way, you'll notice, and you, you know, I go through this, women were the, what, the key. I look at, I look at you know, what you got at Mill City Grows, you know, Lydia and Francie, here Charlotte Kahn, right smack dab in the middle, but they were the ones that organized this network. They were a very small group of only uh, two people, but they then re recruited people from agencies and other nonprofits to fill in the gaps and do things that um, were important. The, 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 the urban farming or urban agriculture movement in Boston was so great back in the 60s and 70s, you may not be able to read that, but the U.S. Department of Agriculture made a special designation for urban farmer. This was like in the 1970s. They even created, and this is things to kind of keep in mind about where the urban farming or urban growers movement may go, they established a Suffolk County, that's the city of Boston, extension service. You know, extension services are things you think rural, right? They, they, and they, that's, they're there to, exist, to assist farmers. The city, the city of Boston had an extension service because there was so much activity going on, and a lot of it had to do with the work of this, this informal network of Boston Urban Gardeners. They also got access to land. They worked with the city. They found a bunch of vacant parcels that made a little oddly shape, maybe not big enough to put a house on or put a commercial development on, and they, they, that is Bug and others, packaged that. And they went to the city, the Boston Redevelopment Authority, and said, we'd like to make a, a, a deal. We'd like to offer 
um, a, 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 give you a price, purchase this land, and turn it into a permanent urban community land trust that would then forever be preserved for urban agriculture. And they did potlucks and dances and did all sorts of fundraising, and they raised the money and they started to put together their plan. So it's, it's a little old fashioned. It's like, and again, with the, with, with, and I'm not, this is, I'm a social networker now too, but mm -hmm. those tools actually even enhance our ability to do this type of work. And, you know, we were talking right before, um, certainly with, to do it within, a, you know, community, but also across communities, because I think that's where you're going to see a lot of things happen. Here's another example of, again, the, you know, urban soils in Boston still are, many cities not that great, you know, so they had to figure out how we we're going to build up the, the topsoil. Bug, was, they, they were not bashful about anything. They needed some topsoil for some of their new farms. They recruited U.S. Army 64th uh, Battalion because there was, a, there was a housing or development going on in Worcester. They were digging up the soil. They actually got the uh, U.S. Army to transport the soil from Worcester to the Boston Urban Gardeners in exchange for paying their tolls and providing lunch. So that's what they did. Now, here's the thing. That was then. Today, if we tried that, it would probably make the headlines of the news, right, and saying, is this the right way to use the, you know, resources? So I'm not saying that, that we, we, we could do that again. I'm not saying we couldn't do it again. But it's just that make the ask. Make the ask. You never know, right, that, that, that someone could say, you're crazy, that's not going to happen. But you also might be surprised and they say, well, you know what, um, tolls and lunch and you got a deal and you got your, you got your topsoil. So I did my, my Boston Urban Gardeners and then I, I, really, I landed at a place called the, the New Alchemy Institute on Cape Cod. And this probably was for me, it was life changing because I'm a city guy. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio on the banks of Lake Erie and Cuyahoga River, so I'm not a farmer. And right, so, but I, but, but, I, but I did get involved in the environment because I lived on the banks of Cuyahoga River and Lake Erie, right? Lake Erie was eutrophied, declared legally dead. Cuyahoga River would erupt in flames because it was so polluted with, with, with flammable pollutants. I mean, it really did burn. Randy Newman, if you just go, you know, burn on Pig River. And you'd stand out, I'd, I'd be a kid waiting for a school bus and little black specks would come out of the sky and I'd look at an adult and say, what's going on? And they really would just nonchalantly say, the river must be on fire again. And that's what, and so, but that had an impact on me. And the impact was, I said, you know what, even though I live in the city, the environment, I am, you know, I'm part of the environment. The environment's part of me. I, I will say back then, this is late 60s, that did not go over so well with my African-American colleagues, especially when I went to Tufts who were struggling, you know, there's a, not, I was part of that movement too, but civil rights, the Vietnam War, women's rights movement. And back then, I will tell you the, the idea that an, black man would devote or commit himself to the environment, which they considered to be a tree, not only, not only would they consider to be tree hugging, but they said, listen to the slogans, Greg, limited growth, no growth. Where's there room for economic equality in that scenario? And so my sense was that you, economic equality and environmental equality have to be compatible. There was nothing in my formal education that gave me a clue to how that was gonna be, but that's why I went to the whole earth catalog. I mean, <clears throat> that was going underground back then, right? Because they were creating a parallel universe uh, and providing some tools and a vision about how you could do just what you're, I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to do now. So, and New Alchemy, again, the first time I understood that we could grow enough food on a tenth of an acre of land to feed 13 people, three vegetable portions a day without the use of any chemical fertilizers, pesticides, or herbicides. We built these geodesic dome greenhouses. We could have fruiting banana trees and fig trees inside. You can, it could withstand hurricane force winds, as you can see in that, but it was light enough that we could pick it up and move it with 30 people to transplant it to another part of the, of, of the, of, of the site. And those tanks, by the way, are filled with, the, it's water, but there are tilapia, there are fish growing inside there. The, when, the, when the water becomes a little too polluted, you take, or not put, yes, we consider it polluted because we don't understand nature always works symbiotically, right? The, the, by, the byproducts of one system are potentially, in, all, in nature almost always, the inputs of another, right? And pollution, as Buckminster Fuller, my guru would once said, pollution is a valuable resource in the wrong place. So we found the right place. We found that plants could use the runoff water from the fish tanks and then we could recycle the water. So it was, a, it was an early example. I'm not gonna, no, this is the only chart. But as we think about urban growers and urban agriculture, it's a system. And if we can think about, you know, the growing 
if we can think about the manufacturing or value added, if we can think about the distribution, if we can think about the retail, if we can think about maybe restaurants and places where they, some if, uh, value added or some raw or fresh produce could be sold in addition to, to, to residents, we might be able to sort of talk about, you know, what about this, this issue of economic viability, which I'm going to come back to because I actually do think that urban growing and urban farming is already economical. When someone says, how are we going to make it economical? My sense, that my response is, it already is. We don't have an economic system that values all the things that we do with urban growing, right? So rather than trying to force ourselves into this mold that they have, we've got to rethink what we mean by economics and talk about it a little bit. But anyway, there's a lot of stuff that can happen there. And some of those tools and some of the strategies, I'm going to go real quick here because I do want to have time for, for questions. But in, in, in some cases, the city of Boston took a major leap um, when I was commissioned, I walked in in the city of Boston had already started these, a two-year process to rezone the city. Zoning is a code. If something isn't in the zoning code, it means it's not allowable. And what you don't have in the zoning code of most cities is commercial farming, right? Because it got, for all, and it's obvious why it's not there, because, you know, farming was rural and you start bringing in manufacturing. But if, so you can garden, you can do, you know, backyard community gardening for self-consumption and that sort of thing. But if you wanted to commercial farm, it wasn't allowable. City of Boston, Boston Redevelopment Authority held public meetings for two years and hammered out zoning bylaws that now allow for commercial farming in the city of Boston. And, and so it's a, it, and not every city, I'm not saying everyone's got to do that, but it is, what it does is demonstrate that, that in the toolkit, in the toolbox, the things that, that different communities can draw from, not that every community's got to do everything that every other community is doing, but we should all know what some have done, what works and what doesn't work, and what you may want to, to use. Somerville didn't go the route of zoning, but did, did come up with their own plan that was supported by the, 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 the city council. So there, you know, it's just an example of some things that could be done. Partnerships, I, you know, I spent four years in a place called the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative that built itself up from, I mean, ruin. It was, you know, a community of Cape Verdean, African-American, Latino, white. One thing they all had in common, they were poor right in the heart of Boston. You're probably sort of interesting that if you notice in the newspapers today, the Boston Globe, it's the one, it's, that's the neighborhood in Boston that Amazon will not do same day delivery to, oh, right? They won't do that. When I, lived, when I worked there, you couldn't get a taxi to take you into there. And as a matter of fact, there was a tourist brochure that came out uh, when I was at the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative back in 1995 to 1999 that actually said, you pick it up at the airport, it said, avoid the orange line. You don't want to go to this community. And so that's what they were struggling with. And, and the community literally was burned to the ground when slum lords and, land, you know, sort of speculators came in, bought up a lot of land because it's great location, right in the heart of the city, access to the Southeast Expressway, airport and other. But the city had a plan to turn into a marina. And all the residents who lived there said, we're, we're not going to be able to live here. This is going to, I mean, obviously we're going to be driven out of here. So they resisted the, 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 the development. But the, the slum lords and the speculators, in order to minimize their losses, especially the Sun Lords, they, they burned their buildings down to collect insurance. So there was about an, a, a hole in the middle of this community of about 30 acres. You could stand in the middle and, and turn 360 degrees and you almost, there was very little standing. Mm. The community rebuilt itself. I won't get into that, but they rebuilt itself with, by, by once again, asking a question, a question that, that almost no other community had ever asked before and that is, we've got this land, it's in ruin, we need to rebuild, it's owned by absentee slum lords, and, and so they asked the city for the power of eminent domain over all abandoned vacant land, and it was granted. And they got that control, turned it into a community land trust owned by the community, rebuilt homes, and put urban agriculture as one of the central, central parts, components of their urban, their urban redevelopment plan, which includes a 10,000 square foot greenhouse, partnering with the, the food project, which is based out in Concord, but they, they created this partnership. To this day, I will tell you, when, when, when the city granted them the power of eminent domain, I think they expected them to fail. They didn't expect, because someone kept, they keep saying to me, well, Greg, if this is such a great experiment, why is it replicated? I said, because it was a great success. <laughs> and the city didn't want a bunch of these other semi-independent, strong, empowered communities saying, could we do something similar? They had created a little bit of a Frankenstein and they didn't want, didn't want to admit that. But, but it is a powerful example of what happens when communities look at the tools and say, you know, we're desperate. 
let's make the ask. The worst thing that could have happened was people could have laughed at him and said no, but they said yes, just like the ask of the soils from it. So anyway, I'm going to go through these. There are, you know, so things are happening. You know, again, land is part of it, but we're finding that, that folks are being innovative and creative, right? You, we've, we've got higher ground doing an open air rooftop um, farm right in the city of Boston, the Boston Design Center. Um, again, because in some, probably, and again, cities are going to have different, different constraints and different opportunities. In Boston, real estate is very expensive. Even finding a little something on the ground is hard to find. But there's relatively uncontested space in some cases on tops of buildings, right? Except now we're, we're solar is like our other main competitor. That's not a bad thing, right? But, but it is a competitor. But, but nonetheless, um, different conditions, windy and all, but can you, can you do that? And some are sort of saying, can we do more than that? I mean, season extenders on the ground, but now people are doing the season extenders on the rooftops, right? Rooftop, not just rooftop open air farms, but rooftop greenhouses so they can take advantage of you know, we are at, at a disadvantage to some extent here in Massachusetts. We do have a short growing season. As I said, you know, and when, when I was c commissioner of agriculture, I went to my first National Association of State Departments of Agriculture meeting in Washington, D.C. So it's all the secretaries and commitment. It was my first time on the job. I was conspicuous in terms of who I was, and then it was also my first meeting. And I sat down next to a stately um, Southern Secretary from, I think he was from North Carolina. One minute, like, this was actually a good story, but he, he looked at me, and he could tell I was nervous, and he looked, looked at me and said, so, so son, what do you all grow in Massachusetts? And I said, well, you know, I, we grow, and I mumbled, you know, we grow spinach and lettuce and carrots and, 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 and uh, oh, you know, peaches and apples. By the way, all those things that we grow, you know what the U.S. Department of Agriculture, how they characterize those? Specialty crops. I mean, the wording, right? They're especially commodities, the things that are the big guys are soy, beans, and, you know, corn, not for our consumption, but for egg. So those are the commodities, and we're the specialty crops, which makes it sound like, yeah. like it's like, kind of like on the fringe, right? But it's all the stuff that we eat. So anyway, he asked me that question, I told him everything, and then he said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. and, and then he looked back at me, and well, there was a twinkle in his eye, and he said, son, you do know that had this country been settled from the west coast to the east, Massachusetts would have been a national park. And if you stop and thought about it for one second, probably right, right? Nobody in their right mind would do that and say, we're going to put, make this one of the densest populated you know, states. So, so and that's, and then that's when I came back with my Yankee ingenuity sort of thing. But anyway, so we got to use the Yankee. You may not have a, have a place here, but here are these freight containers, and someone got the, you know, understood that there are these freight containers that, that sit there because nobody uses them when they come back, and they had, they had busted refrigeration systems. But guess what? If you're growing food in there, you don't want the refrigeration system. You want these things to be warm. So they put in these hydroponic units, LED, lighting. They could be situated. You need electricity, right? But they're hydroponics. Yes, it's not necessarily, the, you know, some people have problems with, with hydroponics, but they get six plantings a year. So, and it's mostly microgreens, salad greens, and so the market for those may not be necessarily the residents. It could, in some in cases it could be, but they actually go more for the high-end restaurants. But again, it is sort of just an example of what can be done. Mel King, Mel King, a 1970s South End legislator, the, probably the most, the strongest advocate for agriculture in the entire Massachusetts legislature. He got me, he got the funding that allowed me to get a job as to organize the Boston Farmers Market. He started this, he got legislation to do a fruition program in Massachusetts, plant fruit trees, permaculture. This is before the Bill Mollisons and the new, before any of us were talking about this. He understood that you, trees are important for so many reasons, but they can, you can get the multiple benefits. If we start looking at things like, you know, can they provide shade? Can they improve the soil? Can they do a lot of things? Can they retain, create microclimates? Can they grow food? But, but once again, he did the ask. How about some money so that we can get communities to plant trees throughout Massachusetts? And so he did that. And right now, there are they're, they're actually some amazing orchards, not all of them being managed, but that can, I think that's going to change in the city of Boston. And, and uh, UMass Amherst got some money to do that as well. But he had the vision. And by the way, you know, Bartlett Pear and the, and the, the Roxbury Russet Apple are from Massachusetts, right? From Boston. I mean, Boston has got great, you know, as a matter of fact, the, Dorchester and Roxbury were the farm, that was farmland, right? That's where the people from the, in the state house, when they wanted to retreat from the city, they'd go to Roxbury or Dorchester because that's where it was. Value added, Commonwealth Kitchen. Now, we've got, them, we've got these happening in other parts, but can there be facilities that will then allow communities or the urban farmers or urban growers to the extent that maybe it could be because you've got a, you overproduction to add value? 
to make the salsas, the salsas, the sofritos, and, the, and, and actually start to realize and maybe sort of the economic viability that can, maybe you can't quite meet, um, uh, but again, that's more a matter, I, I'm coming back, more a matter of the system than it is, I think, the actual practice farming. There are virtually very, it, it's hard to make a living as a conventional farmer in Massachusetts, well, probably in the country, because we've, we, we, we've skewed things so much. And, and, and it's not a matter of small farms or farmers not being efficient or economic. It was a conscious decision. It was a conscious decision. Earl Butts, if you go back to the 1970s, Earl Butts, Secretary of Agriculture, he basically said, we, our plan is to get farmers off the land and to consolidate. Mm -hmm. That was a conscious, and, and so we're gonna, the economics favored consolidation, not individual small farmers. So when someone says the reason why this is happening, because it's a natural thing in the economics, and the, it's not. People make decisions. And those decisions were, and because, by the way, the market for that agricultural strategy was not Main Street, it was Wall Street. You valued farms for what they could get you in the global market and come out, not for, and right now you've got farmers in Texas and other places, you know what they're doing? They're going back to school because they're saying, we'd like to know how you grow food for our community. We don't know how to grow food, mm -hmm. right? That, that our people, because everything we've, we've done has been sort of for the export market. So anyway, Commonwealth Kitchen, and, and, and then sort of taking it to the streets. And, and I mean this, you know, getting out there, whether it's distributing it to, to, to home, I mean, Mill City, once again, in the forefront, but it could also be a, a, a business where people are, the food trucks in Boston are pretty amazing, right? They become very popular. If you go, and, and so many of them though, again, they have prepared foods and they need a US, you know, they need a Department of Health sort of certification. Many of them are using this facility to actually do the, the processing, the cooking of the meals, so that they can then sell in, in their facilities. Um, once again, another ask, my pla the place I now call, at least my, my, my home base, the Berkshires, EF, the Schumacher Center for New Economics works in the Berkshires for a number of years. They are, have developed a local, their own local currency. How do you keep the money circulating within your community? National dollars don't, don't tell you anything about how the local economy is going. They created this, this local currency, the idea being, if you've got money in your pocket, you know, and you get, you know, so for $9, you get 10 Berk shares, so you get a little bit more, but it can only be used for, in, in the region for, cut for businesses that have agreed. I think they've got over 100 businesses that now do it. And so you consciously think now, as I'm going out to buy something, since I got these Berk shares in my pocket, I'm gonna look for local. See who, see who in the neighborhood, and you get more and more people buying them because if you, can, if you can use it at the local grocery store, all the grocer will accept them if he or she knows that they can buy what they need from some, with the Berkshires. And so you start to get this thing going. And it's, it's a conscious, it's a, it's a community building thing. But of course, many people said, the first time they even suggested everybody, you can't do it. Well, but says who? You can't do it, that's like counterfeiting. No, it's not, gotta make the right ask. Um, what, what I love, once again, community growing, there's this multicultural and, multi, and across generation sort of aspect. So food is a connector, right? I mean, you can, we know that it's a great organizing tool. You can, you can pull people together. We need to take advantage of that as much as we possibly can. We've got to recruit young people, and that's why I love what I saw here in the parade, because, you know, the average age of a, of a farmer in Massachusetts, or I think in the U.S., is about 65, 66, which, by the way, I can, that's a new 30. And I consider it to be very young, but nonetheless, we got to start thinking about what the next, next generation of farmers are going to be. And, and I'm telling you right now, because the census, if you look at Massachusetts or any place across the country, many of the new farmers aren't going to come from family farms. The youngsters, they've already left and they're doing some other things. And so places like Lowell, places like Boston, place, urban city may be the place where the future farmers are actually going to get the training and maybe they stay in the city, maybe they'll become rural farmers, but they need to develop those skills. And this is one of the places where people are eager to do that. And one of these places is the, it, it's, it's called the Fowler Clark Farm. Talk to, to Lydia and, and, and Francie about this. It's, it's in, in Boston, Urban Farming Institute. It's actually an 18th century farm that's, once again, this is Mattapan, it used to be a farm, and they've got the farm, they've got the, the barn, they've got the, um, the, the, the actual house, they're gonna turn into offices and a training facility. And so here again, maybe some opportunities to partner with folks like here, here in Lowell. And I'm gonna end, lesson from Cuba, mentioned I'm doing this work, went to Cuba in 2014, right before the handshake between um, uh, Castro and, and uh, President Castro and Obama. 
Um, we went there to take a look at the sustainable food systems for all the reasons that Francie pointed out, because the, you know when the Soviet bloc collapsed back in 1989, 1991, they had no access to petroleum, so they literally had to grow with either face starvation or they had to figure out how they were gonna grow without any fertilized pesticides, herbicides. And they created this incredible agroecology network, farmer to farmer exchange, whatever, and, and, and it really saved them from starvation. So we just wanna see if there's ways that we can do this. And by the, we can learn from them. Urban farms in Cuba, urban farms provide 60 to 70% of the fruits and vegetables consumed in Havana. 60 to 70, are, are from urban farms. And right, the, the urban farms wasn't just, it was done because if you didn't have petroleum, western part of Cuba is about two hour drive, that's where most of the agriculture happened, but if you don't have petroleum to get it from there to the city, you're still out of luck. So they had to grow things closer to the city. And it was done, and again, it came out of a crisis. So I'm gonna end by just saying, it's time to reboot the system. We need to rethink what we mean by economics. We need to, what does it mean to be economically viable? And there are books, I mean, E.F. Schumacher, Small is Beautiful, Lynn Margulis did a book, talk about cooperation as opposed to strictly co competition. Jane Jacobs, the economy, she's an incredible writer, one of the greatest observers of what goes on in, in cities. Norma Klein, Naomi Klein, the reason I put that there is because the context for all this is climate change. And if we don't, if we, we haven't, don't know by now that we've got to start changing and ways that we do things, including the way that we grow our food, industrial agriculture, largest contributor greenhouse gases, soils, the whole bit, and then my guru, Buck, Mr. Fender, I love it, operating manual for Spaceship Earth. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. And I, it, it, not a whole, we need to get uh, things back on track, so if there are some questions, maybe one, but I, I'll stick around if people do want to have it. I would assign for regenerative agriculture, if you have a farm that's not just organic. And, and greenhouse gas and sequestering carbon, the most, the one thing that we all have in common and then probably the easy is using the soils, creating healthy soils. If we create healthy soils and, and do that, soils have the capacity to, to capture and retain carbon, but, but it's, it's based on the structure. It's not that you just got, you know, nitrogen, right, and, 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 and phosphorus chemically added, it's got to be that the structure of the soils will actually take it and hold it in. So, I think Vermont, it, you know, setting the example, uh, I know that people are, t there's a group called Soil for Climate, among others, that are actually talking to Commissioner of Agriculture and talking about signing on and making this a priority for Massachusetts as well. I don't know if it's that we'll come up with that. We'll come up with better science. No, Vermont's much better. So anyway, so anyway I, I do thank you, and I will actually be available if, if people do want to just grab an ear. But 